In previous episodes of this series, I gave you an overview of how I started converting an old application powered by jQuery event handlers on the front end into a modernized Rails Hotwire driven application. I basically threw out the many lines of CoffeeScript code used to perform Ajax requests for updating the page and replaced that code with some simple turbo streams. But I did run into a dilemma when trying to implement an infinite scroll feature because for this feature to work correctly, it requires a piece of metadata, the ID number of the last item on the list, so that it can tell the backend where to start pulling data to append to the bottom of the list. This piece of data is dynamically updated, and for that, I'm going to try using the StimulusJS framework. By the way, if you need more context on where we're beginning this video, I suggest looking at the previous video where I covered the Turbo framework. Also, I have the complete code for this application on GitHub, Check out the link in the video description since this video will cover a lot of material and it may be hard to follow along. Now things get really fun when we start using JavaScript to direct Turbo to load additional data into the web page as we need it. And for that I'm going to introduce a StimulusJS controller that we can use to load additional notes into the content section of the page. And of course, the first thing you have to do is to set up StimulusJS in your project by including the Ruby gem. As you can see, I've got a stimulus rails and a turbo rails gem file entry as individual entries in my gem file, but if you want, you can use the hotwire rails gem, which is a shortcut that automatically includes both of these in your project. Next, you've got to run the rails stimulus install command to get some of the stimulus base files into your project. One of the files it installs is application.js. Here's my application.js file for Webpacker. As you can see, I've got my import for Turbo Rails and importantly, the controllers directory, which will contain all of the stimulus related files. It may also be safe at this point to remove the Rails UJS reference from the top of this file. With advancements in vanilla JavaScript from ES6, the Rails package version of unobtrusive JavaScript helpers may no longer be necessary. Now in the index.js file for the controllers directory, I have this code here, as specified by the stimulus guide, that loads all the files in this folder. Much like Rails, Stimulus follows a convention of having the file name correspond to the class within the file. So for example, the hellocontroller.js file contains the hellocontroller, which you could reference in your view templates as hellocontroller. Note that within the file, however, it just exports a default class extended from controller. You don't see the name hello controller explicitly defined here. And what you're seeing right now, I just copied from the stimulus setup guide. Let's rename this controller to stonk notes controller and reference it in our view template where we intend to use it. Now when we load the page, the stimulus connect method will overwrite the text in that div and we'll see the hello world message. Now let's give stimulus a test to check whether it's working. I'm going to make a button with a data action property set to trigger a display message method on the stonk notes controller. Note that this data action property when added to an HTML tag carries a special meaning when using stimulus JS. That data action attribute is your means of specifying an event handler. Also, this text I wrote here is a special syntax used by StimulusJS designating that the click action of the DOM on that HTML button will point to the stonk notes stimulus controller and trigger the display message method. On this example, I'm specifying click here for clarity, but I really don't have to since click is the default action for buttons. Here's a table of built-in shortcuts for default actions in Stimulus. Stimulus can listen for any event available on an HTML tag by the JavaScript industry standards. The Mozilla Developer website has an excellent reference guide for all such things in vanilla JavaScript. Now that we've got that button wired up, let's go ahead and click it and see that it prints the desired message in console. At this point, I'm going about refactoring my controller's display message method to perform the dynamic work that I'll need it to do. I've outlined this as four main steps of functionality. First, determine the last item on the list that we want to update. Two, get the ID number for that item. 
Then run the AJAX request to pull the next set of items using that ID number as the pagination cursor. And four, insert the new items into the web page. Note that I've come up with these things using the mindset of a vanilla JavaScript and maybe jQuery application, but steps three and four in this case are already handled by Turbo. So instead of writing code to handle those myself, I can just have stimulus trigger the action on the button that we've already made and Turbo can do the request and subsequent population of the data onto the web page. As for that ID number acting as the cursor, that's going to be the only thing dynamically changed by stimulus. So in step one, you can see that I've got my code here to fetch the ID number of the last stonk note element. I'm using the JavaScript function document dot query selector all to find the element that I want. This works very similarly to jQuery's lookup function. You can even use wildcards in your element search criteria. I've also moved the cursor parameter into a hidden input field of the form so that it'll be easier to search for and find and dynamically update in my code. And I've also put a stimulus target label on this field named cursor. So see how I have that HTML attribute named data, the controller named stonk notes dash target that corresponds to the targets property that I specified on the controller itself. So to perform the update of the data, the code within the stimulus controller can simply reference the target element by name and manipulate it like it would any other JavaScript DOM element. So now I'm going to demonstrate how this works by loading up our web page. The load more button is set up just like it was in the last video, but this time when we click it, the cursor parameter will be updated before each request so that we can actually get meaningful data from the backend server. See now when I click it, it reports the current bottom ID number before it submits the request. This is because the data action triggers the update cursor method before the web request is sent, allowing us to update the form parameters as needed. Now to add a finishing touch on this feature, I like to make the infinite scroll work automatically. When the user's browser window scrolls below a certain point on the web page, I want it to automatically run the load more button rather than requiring the user to have to click the button each time. We can figure out where a user is looking on the web page by using the document body client height and window inner height JavaScript DOM properties. This math here will be the trigger point for determining whether we should run the load more query. It basically means that the browser window is within 500 pixels of the bottom of the web page. Stimulus lets us capture window level events. So we can capture every window scroll event of the web browser using this syntax. And within our code, we can create a method called infinite scroll, which will determine whether the scroll bar is at the trigger point that we want to initiate a load of more data. Let's demonstrate this stimulus feature in action. As you can see here, I'm scrolling around the page and the event handler is capturing and reporting scroll events. Now I'm going to build onto this code by making the load more button a target and make stimulus.js programmatically click that button when our scroll trigger event occurs. Here's a demonstration of that code in action. And, uh oh, looks like we got a user aborted the request error. This is happening because our scroll event is getting triggered multiple times very rapidly and it's giving us a concurrency problem. Turbo was working on an initial request, but the scroll trigger event keeps trying to initiate new requests before the first one is complete and it's resulting in this error caused by all of these requests overlapping. We need for stimulus to check whether Turbo is busy before trying to submit another request and therefore we can preempt these unnecessary error conditions. Let's look into the Turbo source code and see what we can use. When Turbo loads, this start method is called, which creates a session object and calls the start method on the session. By the way, do these methods visit, clear cache, and set progress bar delay look familiar? Well, they should, because these are the methods available on the global turbo object, which is a thing that we imported from Turbo Rails at the top of our controller file. Along with these methods, the navigator object on the session is exported to, 
so that should be available by calling turbo.navigator. Let's take a closer look at the session and navigator objects. Inside of navigator, there's a submit form method, which gets called when we're trying to submit a form like our load more button. This method sets up a form submission object and eventually calls its start method. And inside of start, we can see that it manages an object called form submission state. Let's see how the value of that changes as we perform our request using the console logger. As you can see, it starts out as undefined and then goes to two, which corresponds to waiting. Eventually, it will end up at five or stopped. So essentially, we want to only initiate new turbo requests if the current form submission status is undefined or stopped. Let's write a little utility class to help us do this. I'll make an exportable function called turbo ready that only returns true if the turbo form submission state is stopped or undefined. We can go ahead and import this directly into our controller to give it a test. Now let's try this out in our web browser. And there it seems to be reporting the right information in console. Now all we have to do is make the turbo ready function call part of our conditions to check before running the next request. So I'll add that to our if statement and well, we try the website now, you no longer see the excessive failed web request to load more items. It's loading the items as expected. I realize that learning a new framework could be challenging and that the content of this video may have been hard to follow along. So be sure to check out the complete code for this project using the GitHub link provided in the video description. I hope this series gave you a good overview of programming in StimulusJS and Turbo. Be sure to hit the like button on this if you found it informational and subscribe to my channel. Many more episodes like this I have in the works. So I'll see you next time.